Hi, I'm Debbie Stewart, Women's Minister at Green Acres Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas, and we are thrilled that you have joined us for week three of what has been a three-week session on emotions and the heart, along with a study in the book of Philippians in God's Word. And today as we wrap up, we're going to skip through some highlights and work through some main principles of Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Last week we looked at chapter 1, but what I'm going to need to do is go back and pick up the last couple of verses from chapter 1 because they set us up for what we need to know, what we're about to learn in chapter 2, 3, and 4. Now, let me just say this. I believe that this particular teaching is going to be very important to you. I think there's a lot of personal application. For instance, in my own life, the Lord has used this teaching this week to change a faulty belief system that I had developed. I didn't realize I had developed it, but I began to focus on something that this week through the study of Philippians, the Lord said, Debbie Stewart, this is going to change. And to the, to the blessing of the Lord, I hope that I am in process of doing that. And I'm thankful. I'll explain more in a moment, but let's do this. Would you grab your coffee, your dog or whatever else you might need to put in your chair with you. And let's study God's word. Let's read through Philippians chapter one. And then we're going to hit some highlights in two, three, and four. We're going to close with a list of observations and personal application that will help you walk through this with the Lord. I'm so excited about it. Listen, you've already been prayed for today. So let's get right into God's word. I'm picking up in Philippians chapter one. I'm reading verse 29. This is from the New Living translation. Would you just let these words maybe fall fresh on you for the first time and pick out your part of what you need to be doing in this verse. The Bible says this, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. The CSB Christian Standard Bible says it like this, for you have been granted on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but let me just stop right there before we get to that second part. Granted means you have been given a gift. So there are two things that we have been given that the Bible tells us these are gifts. The first, we've been given the gift to believe in him. I love that. I, I've given my life to Christ. I've believed on him for my salvation and I believe in his word. I believe his promises are true. I believe him for the impossible. I believe when he says, in your weakness, I'm strong. I continue that belief process. But there are two important words that changes everything in this verse. The two words are but also. You have been get granted on Christ's behalf, not only to believe, but also. Would you say that just where you're sitting right now? I need that part to sink in, but also. Okay, look, don't say it like that, but also. You need to say it like this, but also. Like a strong, not just this, but also. Also to suffer for him. So let me tell you where I've made my mistake. Let me tell you where I had to realign my life with the Lord is in this part of seeing that suffering is a gift from the Lord. To be honest with you, I have not seen it that way. Oh, well, I'm all about the believe. I love that word. Matter of fact, it's been my life word for some 30 years now, believe. Uh, my life verse is Luke 145. Blessed is she who believes what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. I have sweatshirts that say believe. I have t-shirts. I have a necklace. I have it tattooed. <laughs> Not really. I might though. You don't really know for sure. Believe has been an important word for me. So I'm all about the belief. I'm not so much about the suffering. God's word says not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul goes on to tell us that that suffering is used for the furtherance of the gospel so that more people can come to know the Lord. I can't tell you how all of that works. I don't really understand it myself, but I believe God's word says that if you will suffer well for him, he will use it for his glory. And that is what I want to get to. So my mom, um, years ago, lost a courageous battle with cancer. She was 40, I was 23, and my son was five weeks old. I remember oftentimes my mom saying that she had been given the gift of cancer. I used to get so mad when I would hear her say that because I'm like, it's not a gift. It's a terrible, terrible, horrible thing, and no one should have it. I hate it. But according to God's word, if you've been on that journey at his assignment, 
It is a gift. I guess you'll have to be one of those people that go through it before you actually understand that that is a gift. But also, do you remember what Paul said in other places, not just Philippians for sure, but in other places, he said this, so that I would not become arrogant, a thorn in the flesh was given me. It's the same word. It's the same concept. The Lord gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, granted him, gave it to him like a gift. I don't know about you, but a thorn in the flesh is not going to seem like a gift to me. I feel like a gift from a giver is someone that's going to know me, something I'm going to want, I'm really going to like. But the Lord says that these things are necessary. We're not going to understand all of that fully this side of heaven. That's why the word believe is so important. Paul goes on to say in that verse that three times he asked the Lord about this, that it would depart from him. But he said, my grace is enough for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. So then I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that the power of Christ will reside in me. Therefore, I am content. Get this part list. I'm content with weakness, with insults, with difficulty, trouble, and persecutions for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, He is strong. And this might be a point of an alignment that you need about how you really perceive, perhaps how you define, how, how you really think about suffering. What, what do you really think about it? No, really think about it. Do you see it as a gift? I love how the message, which is a paraphrase of God's word, puts it, says this, there's far more to this life than trusting Christ. There's also suffering for him. And the suffering is as much a gift as the believing. That is the point of realignment I had to make in my life, to believe that the suffering is as much as a gift as the trusting. You know, at times when we're driving our cars, the check engine light might come on. Check engine, check engine. Something's going on. There's flashing lights. Caution, caution. Maybe your, maybe your life needs realignment, like your car needs realignment from time to time. Listen, if you continue to drive a car that needs realigning, you are going to cause damage. And the same is true in life. If you continue on this path, if you continue on this course without aligning your life according to God's word and, and realigning to fall in line to what he says and practice what he says, then you're going to cause damage in other areas. Recently, I received a text from a great friend of mine uh, who is also walking through a, a journey of cancer. She too understands that gift uh, that, that uh, suffering is a gift. Let me just read to you. This is what she sent to me yesterday. We were talking about this, and this is what she said. Now, she has had cancer. She's had radiation. She has had chemo. She has had surgery. She's about to underdo, undergo another round of chemo. She said, the intimacy with the Lord experienced over these last six months is more valuable to me than the healing itself. I have prayed that God would do what brought him the greatest glory so that I could remain at this level of closeness to him. I am enjoying it. If healing is given to me, then that is great. If healing is not and the Lord is glorified, well, it's a win-win. Girl, it's all about perspective and how you view this. So with that as our backdrop, with that as our launching pad, let's look at some highlights from chapter two as we realize and now adjust our lives to suffering is a gift. Chapter two of Philippians is all about developing and displaying Christ-like character and mindset. Developing and displaying. It's about caring for others. It's about letting your light shine brightly, is what the Word says. It's about being a faithful worker and a courageous soldier. I was with my grandkids recently, and they're on pretty much of a schedule. Their mom is very much like me. I've told the Lord, he totally needs to do something about that. But she's very structured like me. And so we had our, our schedule of what we needed to do. And then there was 30 minutes of, of uh, TV time. So we had done all of our activities. You know, I don't know what it is about this season when you're a parent, you certainly have rules, but as a grandparent, you're like, rules? I'm not following your rules, <laughs> but don't don't tell her I said that. So, so we're on our schedule, 30 minutes of TV time, and they all chose this particular uh, cartoon I had not seen before. And uh, they put on, and they're watching, and there is not one word in this 
series, this little cartoon series we're watching. So I asked my oldest son, Clark, I said, are there not any words? I saw a lot of action. I saw a lot of activity. I never heard one word. I said, do they not do any talking? Are there not any words? My grandmother name is Dodie. And he said, no, Dodie, there aren't any words in this cartoon. You know the good guys from the bad guys by watching what they do. Well, well, do tell. If that's not the same in our life, we have a lot of action. We have a lot of activity. But the truth is, you're going to know the good guys from the bad guys by watching what they do, what they do to one another, how they treat one another without saying one word. So in chapter two, we have two verses that I would like to highlight. I hope you'll take time to read the entire chapter. But verse five says this. Verse five says, your attitude should be the same as Jesus, that we should have a Christ-like attitude. That means that we give value to what Christ tells us to set our mind on. And listen, you set your mind, you set your focus just like you set anything else in life. Uh, I have settings on my phone. If I want my phone to do a certain thing, I go to settings and, and I can control it that way. I feel like at times we have settings. We can, we can control some things by, by setting things. Uh, at Thanksgiving, we just went through that. Well, we're almost at Christmas. We'll, we'll all set the table. Think about that for a moment. Do you know why you set your table for a meal for someone? You do that in anticipation for what's about to come. The same is true in our lives. We have setting. We set our minds on things above. We set our minds on Christ-like, on heavenly perspective, to have a Christ-like attitude. So that's one verse I wanted to highlight in chapter 2. The second is verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey Him and the power to do what pleases Him. Well, if he gives you the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him, what else do you need? Oftentimes I get up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, good. I'll give you the desire to do that. Sometimes I wake up and I think there's no way I can do that. Great. The Lord's going to give me the power to do it as well. As long as I'm walking this thing out with the Lord, he gives you the desire to do what pleases him and the power to also do that. So we are really without excuse. So as we begin thinking about attitude changes, just a little self-evaluation at this moment, do you have a Christ-like attitude? Is your mindset, is your focus on the things of the Lord or have they been on other things? In chapter three of Philippians, oh, I wanted to go back and hit one more thing in chapter two before we move on. It's the one of the last verses, verse 15. The Bible says, let your light shine brightly. How can you let your light shine this week brightly before others? Maybe without the speaking of a word, like the cartoon series, or your actions and activity. How can you shine, be a light in a dark place as God calls us to be? Then in uh, chapter three, two verses I wanted to highlight, 12 and 13. Let me read them for you. Philippians um, chapter three, verse 12 says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I keep working toward that day when I finally be all that Jesus Christ saved me for and what he wants me to be. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm still not what I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing. Girl, listen, I can focus my mind, energy on a lot of things. The Bible says, would you concentrate on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. So forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. This becomes a compass in our life. This becomes the plumb line, the guidance that we need to make spiritual progress, forgetting behind, but looking forward and pressing on, making those steps of faith. We have a handout called uh, Think This, Not That. You can find it on our website, greenacreswomen.org. If you've ever seen those things on TV that say, eat this, not that. Unfortunately, it says eat kale, not broccoli. But we have changed that a bit. And we looked up the top 25 based on, on clinical psychologists 
things that people come in for counseling, what they are dealing with, different issues. We've identified the top 25 and we have given the scripture. Don't think this, think that. And we've given you scripture, those things like, I'm not good enough, or this is never going to work out, or this is such a waste of time. We look at those things that the enemy tries to lie to us about, and we make a scriptural reversal, and we begin to focus on God's word. What does God's word say about our minds in these situations? What we know medically is that what you think about grows. If you think about what is negative, what is hurtful in the past, things that have happened, what you think about grows. Thoughts are going to fly in and out of your mind all day long. Matter of fact, Cleveland Clinic said we think upwards to 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Now, I'm a total overachiever, so I'm like 100, 120, easy. Anybody else? So those thoughts are coming in. And then there's something called um, ants, automatic negative thoughts. Have you ever thought, where did that come from? Well, that was random because our our minds continue to process and they give these emotions. And then add the spiritual side to not only the clinical and medical side, how the enemy tries to throw thoughts to see what's going to stick, see what negative, discouraging thought that can cause you anxiety. He does this all day long for us. Here's what we need to know. Our thoughts are connected to our emotions. Some thoughts that we have produce fear, anger. Some thoughts that we have might produce anxiety. Uh, I've been battling some thoughts just this week that have produced sadness and they produce grief. Think about what your thoughts are producing because they're attached to your emotions. Thoughts are attached to emotions. But this is what the Bible says. Think on this one thing. Think on this one thing. Uh, If we kept going to Philippians chapter 4, the main verse I wanted to highlight is verse um, 8. And it says this, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say this one more thing. So this is in closing. He is saying, Fix your thoughts on what is pure, honorable, what is right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting these into practice. We cannot only just read God's word, even study God's word. It is so important that we put God's word into practice and that we start looking at what God says. This is what I want you to look at and think about. Honorable, praiseworthy, good report. Proverbs 1530, I believe, says that the eyes will light up when truth is given and that a good report makes the bones healthy. Listen, when you meet someone, you ought to say, tell me something good, tell me something good. Let's strengthen our bones with good reports. But oftentimes, when we've seen one another, we're giving some bad report. The Bible says, focus on what's excellent, what's on good report, what is praiseworthy, and begin to think on these things. What is a good report? Here's how to kill those negative thoughts that come in and can overtake us at different times. You don't focus on it. You don't give it time. Here's what happens in the frontal lobe of your brain. When a thought comes in, neurotransmitters start firing and they start firing in connection to what does this thought represent? Good emotions, bad emotions, a past experience, a person, a relationship, something that happened. And the more you think about it, the more that it grows and grows. Here's how to kill that. You don't think about that thing. You think about these things that God word, that God's Word tells us to think about. And it causes that previous thought to die. The neurotransmitters are working on one thing or the other. If you stop thinking about this and move those thoughts to this side, then you can begin to kill that thought. Another scripture is um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 that says, Bring all of my thoughts in captivity under obedience to Christ. We have had... Uh, a familiar struggle cycle back through in our family, something we have worked through for years, and we thought we had come to the end of that journey, but we are not. And just this week in studying Philippians, the Lord has reminded me that this time of suffering is a gift. And I want to adjust my thinking to that. But through my study, one of the things, just to be quite transparent with you, that the Lord brought to my mind as I, I had prayed through this scripture and stopped thinking about those things and, and replacing those thoughts. 
So I was thinking about that. I said, Lord, I, I am surrendered. I am surrendered to this process. This is where we are, and I'm surrendered to it. I felt like that that was an honorable thing to say in the moment. I'm going to tell you exactly what the Lord put in my spirit as I said that. He said, you're surrendered to it, but you're not abandoned to it. I wish I could tell you that I'm at the spiritual depth where I said, oh, thank you, Lord, for pointing that out. Let me make these changes, but I didn't. Here's my initial thought when I felt that from the Lord, when he said, you're surrendered to it, but you're not abandoned to it. My thought was, well, that's harsh. That seems harsh to me. But here's the truth. The Lord knew that my attitude about surrender was more like, okay, fine, I give up, raise the white flag. I'm no longer, I get it, I'm no longer in charge. I'm not in control. I'm not calling the shots. Anymore. I surrender. He knew that's what was in my heart. And he has called me to a level of abandonment, which means I now have no cause. I have no dog in this fight. I have no cause to let this run uh, amok in my life. But now I am following the Lord through this process. I want to have total abandonment to the will of God at all cost. It's a little different than surrender. So in my thoughts just this week, as, as we hit a new low in the process, my thoughts begin to go toward those emotions that are attached to what has happened. Grief and sadness, immediately the Lord brought to mind. You are practicing thinking on the good things and thinking on what is praiseworthy. And so immediately I stopped thinking about that. And you know what I started thinking about? I started thinking about what happened last Saturday. Last Saturday, we were in East Texas Treatment Facility, which is that prison houses men and women. We had our Christmas message there and 174 women showed up in the gym for the Christmas message that day. 15 women gave their life to Christ in prison. And then we began to sing some Christmas carols that they wanted to sing. And their favorite, when I asked, was Silent Night. And I'm going to tell you, we have sung Silent Night for years in our church at the Christmas Eve service. It's one of the favorite things of my life. But nothing moved me like hearing women in prison singing Silent Night, Holy Night, All is calm, all is bright. Listen, they're sitting in prison. How can all be calm and all be bright? They're not going to see their children. They're not going to see their family. There's going to be no Christmas meal. There's going to be no presents. There's nothing. You know what it reminded me of? It's connected to all of this in Philippians. It reminded me of the Grinch who stole Christmas. How he thought Christmas was all about the stuff and the things. And when all of that was removed, those people were not moved. They still sang with great joy. Uh, about the goodness of God and the greatness. And that's what we can do. So when those thoughts begin to evade your mind and come in like a flood, the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will set up a standard against him. I love that. You have all the help you need from God's word. If we continue to put into practice these things, well, we are here to help you in any way at Green Acres Baptist Church. You can follow us at greenacreswomen.org. All of these videos are available for you. and We hope that you will continue to connect with us. Let us know how we can pray for you today.